start with the scripture. It's always a good place to start it. St. Paul writing to the Romans. Chapter 5, verse 20. It's a very simple scripture, but it's one we need reminding of because it's easy to forget. St. Paul says this, However much sin increased, grace was always greater. And it's very, very simple. And the Jews knew this. Look at the Old Testament. It's a constant story of sinful people forgetting about God, going back to him when times are bad. And then forgetting him when times are good. And then disaster happens, so they go back to God. And it's over and over again. It's, it's just all the way through the Old Testament. But there's another theme, a theme I want to remind you of. That behind all those disasters, when things are going badly, there's always a remnant that keeps the faith. A small group of people who believe in God, who trust in him, and they're there to bring light into the dark times, to bring light into the darkness, to rebuild the ruins of Jerusalem, to rebuild the ruins of the church. If you read the book of Nehemiah, especially chapters three and four, you find a people brought back from Babylon to, to a country they didn't know, they weren't born there. They'd been born in Babylon and their job is to rebuild Jerusalem. And they get laughed at by the locals. They have to fight, they have to build the walls with, as he says, with swords in their hands. They're being attacked from within and from outside. But God brings good from evil. We're living in difficult, dark times. There are problems in the church. Father was talking about people who, who said, no, I don't like charismatic things, even though I've never been to them. We've got problems within. We've certainly got problems from outside. Society doesn't particularly like Christians. We're salt in the wound, if you like. We're light in the darkness. And the evil in society seems overwhelming. I mean, yes, we won yet again the vote not to kill anyone who doesn't quite fit our idea when they're old or they're a bit sick. Let's get rid of them because it's cheaper. Because that's what society wants, and that's wrong. And we keep telling them, but no, we'll have another act of parliament in another 10 years to try again. And we've got to fight against it. But we need to remember God's promise. I am with you, always, to the end of time. That Calvary was a great triumph. It was Pope Benedict. He, he pointed out, you can't have Easter Sunday without Good Friday. No cross, no resurrection. And we are called to take up our cross, each one of us in our daily lives, and show that we trust in God despite whatever happens, despite all the problems. And I want to remind you, to remind myself that God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. Shall we say it? God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good and that's his nature. Wow, wow, wow. We need to hold on to that. We need to believe it. I want to remind you who you are. I want to remind you where you are, why you're here. Why you're here now, today. You're here in England, in Birmingham. <coughs> because God wants you to be. It's not an accident. He's a big God, he knows what he's doing, he's put you here. This evening he'll put you somewhere else, but he'll have a plan. He has a good and perfect plan for your life. Your name 
is inscribed on the palm of his hands. It says so in scripture. God the Father dances with delight over you. It says that in scripture. You are beloved child of God. Son and daughter, son or daughter of the Father. Jesus Christ is your brother. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit through your baptism. You're loved by God. And he says to you, God the Father says to you, as he said to his son, you are my beloved child. In you, I am well pleased. Can you say that now to your neighbor? You are a beloved child of God. He is well pleased with you. Just grab a neighbor and say, you are a beloved child of God. He is well pleased with you. Say it, say it to the person on the other side as well. You see, he's a loving father. And those of you who, who are parents know you cannot say to a child, sit still and be good. We well, can say it, but it won't work. God, your loving Father, says, I've got stuff for you to do. Because he's a loving parent. He wants you to do things. He wants to involve you in his work of salvation. Go right back to the Garden of Eden. The first command was, commandment was to, to multiply, to fill the earth, to master the earth. God wants to use us. He wants to use us to be salt and light in the world. Light in this darkness. And Almighty God has called you to live here in England. Just as he's called Father Soji to go to Manchester and back to India for a bit. But at the moment you're here. And you have a job to do. You're called to be salt and light. Light in the darkness that's in this land now. And only you can be you. I can't do it justice, but John Henry Newman said it. Blessed John Henry Newman. Hoped to be a saint soon, but he became a convert. And, and, and he wrote, it's a sort of prayer, but he's pointing out that God has chosen each one of us and he's given us something to do and only we can do it. Only you can meet the people that you're going to meet this evening or tomorrow. I can't. The person next to you can't. It's you. Every person you meet is a beloved child of God. And you have an opportunity to help them. And God has given you that opportunity. You have a place in salvation history. You have a place in the salvation of this country. And if that sounds a big job, it is. You're right. If you think there aren't very many of us and there's 60 million people living in, in England, you're right. But when God is with us, who can stand against us? We've just sung that. We've got to believe it. We've got to act on it. There's, those of you who've heard of the charge of the light brigade, ours not to question why, ours just to do or die. And if you die, you go to heaven. So where's your problem? It's do it. It's work for salvation. And what I want to do now, and I, I've, I've stolen this from a, a lovely Irish priest, God rest his soul, a, a priest called Jimmy Collins, who a few of you may have come across. A wonderful priest. He's about that high. He used to say, us leprechauns are an endangered species. He, was, he used to stand and he said, can you hear me? And everybody would say, yes. And he'd say, can you see me? And they'd say, no. And I remember he gave a talk in Walsingham. And it was wonderful. He took us on a journey. And I want to take you on that same journey now. A journey through the history of this country. I want to show you how God brings light out of darkness and show you that yes you're part of history and he keeps doing this and now he wants you to do it. It's not an accident. I want to show you why I believe now 
is the favourable time. 2 Corinthians 6, 2. It says, now is the favourable time. This is the day of salvation. England is the place. That's where we are. It's what you're here for. We are the people God has chosen. And we have work to do, every single one of us. And there is a crowd of saints cheering us on. So let's go back 2,000 years. England didn't exist. The English didn't exist. Just a bunch of tribes fighting each other. And then the Romans came. Bless them. And they enslaved the people. And they killed people. And they burnt the villages. They took slaves. We know they took slaves because they took some back to Rome. But with the Romans came Christianity. No Romans, no Christianity in England. And the seeds of the faith were sown in this country. And it was a time of martyrs. Lots of them. If you've heard of St Albans, St Alban was killed for sheltering a priest. It was difficult times. But that's when the monasteries were founded. And when the Roman Empire collapsed, that's what kept the faith alive. The monasteries were there. And then about 600 AD, Pope Gregory, having seen these slaves in Rome, sent St Augustine, an Italian, another immigrant, and he sent him to Kent, the south of England. And he evangelised, and other missionaries came. St Aidan came from Ireland, St Cuthbert from Scotland, and they sorted out the north of England. If you've heard of St Chad's Cathedral, it's named after St Chad, who was a bishop around about then. He was up in Durham. Lots of holy places. Isle of Iona, Lindisfarne, St Winifred's Well in Wales. They became places of pilgrimage. And St Bede wrote about all this, so we know. But it was a dark time. There was a flourishing, and then came the problems. And guys with horns on their helmets, where did they come from? Satan? Vikings came, and they attacked. They came to steal, they came to murder. But God raised up King Alfred the Great, to whom Our Lady appeared. I didn't know that until I was sitting reading about this talk. King Alfred the Great, who burnt the cakes, a lady appeared to him, and he gave, she gave him such a strange prophecy. She told him to have faith and hope without foundation. Well, there's a lovely prophecy for our lady who stood at the foot of the cross and hoped without foundation. Bleak times. But God kept the faith alive and he raised up a saint. A king who was a saint. Edward the Confessor. He's the only English king to be made a saint. And he was a good king. He was kind to the poor. Which was a strange thing for kings to do in those days, but that's what he did. And he kept the faith alive. And then problems. 1061, nearly a thousand years ago, a lady appeared in Walsingham. Why? To give comfort to the people for the dark times ahead. Because then the French came and invaded. William the Conqueror. You sort of get the clue in his name. He conquered England. He enslaved the people. Problems. But... That was the start of the greatest growth of Christianity in these islands. That was the really holy time. That's when stuff happened. Oxford and Cambridge, they were founded. And they were founded with colleges with names like Trinity, All Souls, St John's. These were Christian places of learning. They were the only places of learning. Because God was using Christianity to evangelise this nation. 
There were more churches in London than in any other place in the Christian world. All the kings and queens of England used to go to Walsingham to visit the shrine of Our Lady and they would walk the last mile barefoot. It's where the Catholic shrine is now. It's called the Slipper Chapel where they took their shoes off. Even Henry VIII would have walked, in fact, say would have, he did walk that mile barefoot and he lit a candle. But disaster. Henry, like Solomon, fell in love with someone who wasn't his wife. In his greed, he tried to destroy Catholicism. He killed priests. He wrecked the monasteries. He destroyed the hospitals and schools. You can read about it, but it's horrid. A time of real disaster in this country. And a new wave of saints. So we had St. Thomas More, the Chancellor the highest post in the land. He was executed because he said what Henry was doing was wrong. Just like John the Baptist, as you say. The world doesn't necessarily love prophets who say you're doing the wrong thing. There were bishops executed, there were priests executed. Forty martyrs of England and Wales. Lay people died for their faith. Margaret Clitheroe, crushed under a door in York. Dark times. People held mass secretly. Just as they do now in Saudi Arabia. I was there about 10 years ago and three people from the Philippines had tried to hold a mass in their own house and they were in jail. And when I left two weeks later, they were still in jail. England was like that. It was that bad. Priests were just hung, drawn and quartered. But it didn't stop immigrants coming and trying to sort it out. Jesuits from France, Jesuits from Italy. Then about 150 years ago, Catholicism was allowed. You weren't sent to jail for being a Catholic. And a man called Blessed Dominic Barbary, a saint who I've spoken about here before, read his life. He was born in Italy and he, he had a vision and, and, and he knew he was sent to evangelize England and it took him 46 years after the vision before he even got here. And when he got here, people threw stones at him, so he kissed the stones. And they laughed at him because he didn't speak the language very well. Apparently, he, he said to a group of nuns, he meant to say, you need faith to be saved. And he said, you need face to be shaved. <laughs> that was the level of his English. And yet, he founded churches throughout this diocese. When we had the year of faith, Archbishop Bernard dedicated the year of faith to Blessed Dominic Barbary's intercession because he made thousands of converts, including blessed John Henry Newman. And he was a guy who hardly spoke English, who came from another country. I think some of you can see where I'm going with this. Bless him. Thank you for him, Lord. You see, this country has survived two world wars. And yet, look at it. By the way, I'm only half English. My mother was from Ireland. If you speak to most people in England, you'll find, certainly go back to their grandparents, there's not many English, 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 English. It's a great country like that. But it's a mess. It's a spiritual disaster. Let's take the things that everybody knows. Even the atheists have heard of the Ten Commandments. Well, let's just go through them. Thou shalt have no God before me. Well, take your pick. Football, rugby, shopping, Big Brother, Coronation Street. Almost 
anything but go to church. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. We've wrecked that one. Keep God's name holy. For many people in this country, the name Jesus is only known as a swear word. It really hit me when I was working, one day working with the post office management team, and a guy who was a Hindu, and a perfectly nice Hindu, uh, and something happened, and he, he swore he used the name Jesus. And I thought, where did he get that from? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's scary. Atheists use the name Jesus as a swear word. Well, who started that? Sunday. Huh. Keep Sunday special. <clears throat> this country is facing a disaster of stress and overwork because some idiots thought taking one day off a week and dedicating it to God was a bad idea. I know companies where the level of suicides as a direct result of stress are a major problem. And they're sort of wondering if maybe what they call spirituality might help a bit. And the answer is, well, it might, but the name Jesus will help a lot more. Honour your father and your mother. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Many people don't even know who their father is. There are whole tower blocks throughout this country where there's no fathers. It's almost becoming the norm. You just have children. And if you're reasonably good, you might even keep them. I remember working, we set up a center for homeless young kids and we had to turn a guy away because we could only do 16 to 18 year olds. He was 11, his parents had come down from Scotland to London and then they'd gone back to Scotland and left him there. Yeah, this idea of family is being attacked. It's being attacked by government policies, quote me if you like. It's being attacked by the tax system. It's being attacked by society. And yet God says, honour thy father and thy mother. And society has now got problems because it's ignoring God. Remember the Old Testament? Thou shalt not kill. Oh, gosh. I think it was um, Lord Alton who pointed out that in, I think it was 1965, when they introduced abortion in this country as perfectly legal, they spent about half an hour discussing it. The previous day, they'd spent a full day discussing fox hunting. <laughs> That's the attitude. Killing people is perfectly normal. Euthanasia will be next. Ignoring refugees. Does it really take children dying by drowning for this country to realize that letting people die is still murder? And I'm only on commandment number five. <laughs> no stealing. Oh, cheating's become normal. Even MPs. Well, you just put your expenses in. And you double them. And you've got a house, but you don't live in it. But let's pretend you do, because then you get money. The bankers. One end of society. The benefit cheats at the other. And probably everybody in between thinks it's normal. Everybody demands their rights. Let's have a riot. Let's loot a few shops. Number seven, adultery. Huh. Sex is everywhere. It sells. Look at the television. Look at Coronation Street, East Enders. In fact, don't look at them. All you've got is constant sex outside marriage. Sex is wonderful. That's why God created marriage. But what we have is a nation, is a society that thinks it's perfectly normal. So you give children of eight, nine and ten lessons in contraception. 
so they don't get hurt? Oh, come on. False witness, again. Lying is normal. I remember there was an Irish MP, Bernadette Devlin, and she stepped down as an MP. And they asked her why, and she said, well, I couldn't lie that much. <laughs> it's awful. Our society thinks lying is normal. People fill in an insurance claim and they double it. That's wrong. It's ruining society. It's not what God says. Don't covet your neighbour's wife. What do you think pornography is? That's what it is. Coveting your neighbour's wife. And it's universal and society is saying, oh, how do we stop all these young children access it, assessing it? And the answer, I suspect, is very simple. Let's abolish it. But then, of course, the adults couldn't watch. Good. Don't covet your neighbour's goods. Oh. Ever seen an advert? Ever seen an advert that suggested you should covet another's goods? Because that's what they're there for. Oh gosh, what a mess. Old Testament. Sin is everywhere. But that's exactly when grace abounds. That's what I started with. However much sin increased, grace was always greater. There is light in the darkness. There's a cloud of darkness over this country, but there is light. Do you want to know where the light is? Look in the mirror. You're the light. You're the light in the darkness for this country. It doesn't really matter whether you want to be in this country. You are here. It doesn't even matter whether you like this country. You're called to love those you meet, to be a light in the darkness to them, wherever you are. You are a child of God. You're a light on the hill. You're the salvation to those you meet. You are saints. When we hear in Mass about Paul's letter to the Romans, the Philippians, the Ephesians, the Corinthians, we think they're sort of writing to holy people. And he, he sort of is. Because he starts off his letters, I'm writing to the saints in Rome, the saints in Philippi, the saints in Ephesus. Well, when you read the letters, you found in that they had their problems. You are the saints in West Bromwich, in Birmingham, in Swindon, in Walsall, in London. You're the saints where you live. And Paul's letters are written to you. And you can't say you're not up to the job. It's been tried. Abraham said, I'm too old. And God said, no, you're not. Jeremiah said, I'm too young. Timothy said, I'm too young. And God said, no, you're not. Moses said, well, I can't speak properly. And God said, what's that going to do with anything? <laughs> Jonah, oh, I just read the story, particularly if you've come here from another country. Read the story of Jonah, who tried to run away. He didn't want to go and talk to the people of Nineveh. He hated them. The last thing he wanted to do was to convert them, because then God would be nice to them. So he tried to run away. And look what happened. God brought him back and said, no, do it. And the people of Nineveh were saved. Where's Nineveh? Here, now. Where's Jonah? Look in the mirror. Peter, Peter said he was too sinful. I quite like that one. It's a reasonable excuse. You'll probably say, well, I'm not good enough for all this. But that's the whole point. Of course you're not good enough. Of course I'm not good enough. No one's good enough. There's always too many problems. 
The job is always bigger than we think we can cope with. Here's a quote from scripture. John 15, 16. You'll find it at every seminary in the Catholic Church. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go out and produce lasting fruit so that the Father...